Hello, everyone, and welcome to Human Humane Architecture here on Think Tech Hawaii. I am the co-host of this program, DeSoto Brown, and floating above me is the host of the program, Martin Despang, who is joining us from Germany. So, Martin, take it away. Good afternoon, DeSoto and everyone. Hello. Good to be back. I'm, I, I hear it looks like we're there together, but I'm 12,000 kilometers or miles yes. or whatever away. So. Yes. So good to be back on the island. We promised in the last show with Mayumi and John Hara that we're going to do sort of an architectural critique of what is going on on the uh, UH West Manoa campus. West Oahu. So if we can, uh, West Oahu, thank yeah. you very much. I'm still in Manoa. No, 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 no. Always and forever. If we yeah. can go to slide number one, that's what we were talking about and showing uh, John and Mayumi's very classy architecture out there as sort of these utilitarian um, uh, objects in the uh, in the plains of uh, yeah. the uh, Kapolei uh, Valley, I guess we can say. And let's jump into the next slide here, which is something that Kurt Sandburn was pointing out when he interviewed John, that he was inspired by what was there before, prior, which was sugarcane production and these very sort of large, utilitarian, iconic uh, structures. Um, and so I, I just wanted to reflect on that a little more and threw in these two pictures. The bottom one is one of these structures in Kauai, actually, when I was walking to the Kauai Inn. And the top one is in Maui. And you have some something to say about the yeah. top one, right? Yeah, so that's a helicopter shot that you, you were able to go fly over Maui and take a picture of. This is the HCNS Sugar Mill, which is located in the Central Valley of Maui, and we think maybe this was the very last day that that, that mill was functioning, because by now it is shut down. We have no sugar production in the Hawaiian Islands anymore, but as we have said, the area where the Wastawahu College campus is located formerly was sugarcane, was sugar fields, and the mill was one of the major iconic structures in the area. Exactly. And thanks to Jay Mormon, who took me on a helicopter ride. Hi, Jay, and thank you. I was able to take that picture, and he told me this was the last day, literally the last day of production. So yeah. ever since then, there is no smoke coming out of the smokestacks Correct. anymore, right? Right. And I threw in the little pictures here, uh, which are about a show we did about the uh, sort of uh, Corbu Brie Soleil, um, so the influence of the Corbusiers, who many call a father of brutalism, amongst modernism as well. And and he was doing these brief soleils, and he was, um, at, at some point, he was very informed and inspired by these iconic uh, Midwestern uh, mainland grain elevators, concrete grain elevators that we see on them in the middle of the three images here. And then I did a little bit of research and catching up with my architectural history education, continuing education, and I found out that uh, he was inspired by the uh, Ameri the German architect, Walter Gropius, who then immigrated to uh, America as many of his colleagues and was uh, one of the founders of the Bauhaus that you're very interested, by the way, as well. But uh, why are we saying this? Because uh, obviously, as you can see uh, in the picture that we choose in the show for the Brie Soleil, uh, Le Corbusier was not using this inspiration literally, right? He mm -hmm. abstracted that. Correct. Uh, quite a bit. So and so did John and Mayumi, right? They're Correct. not in a postmodern way mimicking some kind of form that they just throw on it, but they're, they're very sensitively interpret. Right. That. And John said in the in the show that we did with him, the smokestack of the mill building, the sugar mill building, was what inspired him to create the tall central uh, kind of pylon or steeple that he did within the quad of this new campus. Absolutely. But then if we go to the next slide, something sort of at least surprising happened from John and Mayumi's point, sort of tragic, that they weren't, well, they, they pulled the job to design the, uh, what they call the administration building. And these are pictures we took when we were there. And in fact, you were there. You just came from there. To yeah, I was just there earlier ago. today. Yeah, I was. And mm -hmm. I drove past this. So, so this is looking, you know, standing in John and Mayumi's sort of quadrant here there's the classroom building and the lab building and what you were looking at we're going to talk about today and the next slide is uh introducing us to the designers this is their 
beginning. This is the Crow Island School uh, north of Chicago. I checked this out about at the beginning of my full-time academic career in America, so around 2006-ish. Gentleman you see in there is my best uh, college buddy, buddy since college, uh, Dan Kubrick. Hi, Dan. Dan is working for uh, the German architect Helmut Jahn and with him in Chicago. So hopefully he's safe because they got like frigid minds. If you think it's cold here, they got 20 or 30 or 40 below. and It doesn't matter if Celsius or far and high it's cold enough so hopefully you yeah. buddy you stay safe not and here this, in Honolulu was, however <laughs> no no and so this school was built in uh, 1940 so very early and it became a very sort of iconic raw model for architectural yeah. uh, and uh, for, for educational typology yes, yes. And the architects were, uh, at that point, um, were Perkins and Will, who had just started to be a firm in 35, and they didn't feel confident enough to get such a big job, so they got some uh, more established architects on board, and they were the father and son Saarinen, Eliel mm -hmm. and Aero right. Saarinen, and, right. and Aero is the architect of the TWA building that you visited yep. not that long ago, and we featured in a couple of shows. So here you can see uh, sort of how they started, and then let's go to the next slide. This is sort of many years after that. They're now a, a, a very large firm with 2,000 employees um, headquartered uh, still in, in Chicago, but they got offices all around the United States and, and um, I guess, the world. So um, let's, let's look at this sort of combination of images here and let's quote the uh, the principal of the firm who was the lead designer and his name is Mark uh, Takaba and uh, I was online and I was reading that he's not only a native of Hawaii but also a graduate from the University of Hawaii Manoa School of Architecture. And I said and did see. he get taught by that man above me, him? Yeah, and I said, well, I think we just missed each other. But let's read what Mark is saying here in the in the, uh, the design explanation, I guess. He says, the design of this building through its siding, its form, and its engagement with the land was influenced by the ecology and history of its location, which is very eloquently said. But we were talking before the show, what does it really mean, yeah. right? I mean, what in specific... And we, we said, you know, many people who are not architects, what do you think they would see when they look at the silhouette of the building? Right, and we both agreed that we thought that the potential influence was the jagged outline of the mountains, the Ko'olau Mountains and the Waianae Mountains that are visible from that location. But we're also not sure that that's exactly what his statement meant, and maybe that's too literal an interpretation. Yeah, and let's go a little bit more to the specifics and analyze the building. And let's go to the next slide. So the building in plan is a sort of an L, and the shorter bar of the L is what we're looking at here now. And this orientation is very important. Um, if we remember the previous slide, we were looking at the southern elevation. So then this thing is sticking out to the north, and we're looking at it from the east. So we've been talking about thermal performance as something that has always been very important for any culture in the world, and Hawaiians have dealt with that fairly well with their halepili hollies, you know. And, and so this one here has an opaque facade with basically uh, punctuations in there. We, we can wonder, you know, how much glass that is to keep the building cool, and we get a clue about it in the next slide here where I took that picture uh, while I was sort of scavenger hunting the uh, building just before it was finished, and I was, you know, peeking through the window and taking this picture. And you can see the, the shades being rolled down on the right, and that gives you an indication that there might be too much sun coming in from that side. So that makes you wonder how climatically responsible the building actually right. is. Right. And so... Uh, Next slide is John and Mayumi introduced the all Hawaiian theme of a lanai very successfully Correct. to the building. And the next slide, so did these architects almost exactly very generous, very deep lanais as sort of buffer spaces from the interior to the exterior. I recognize when we talked yesterday that John and Mayumi had put these sort of structural slab columns uh, in direction of your view 
while they were sort of doing it the other direction, so that it's more like blocking the view actually. Right. Correct. Point. Right. right. Um, the next picture is uh, me peeking into a classroom that I'm obviously able to look through. Yeah, next I don't slide, think Rob. there's cross ventilation uh, because that looks like a fixed window, and I see these sort of telling uh, AC outlets in the in the drop ceiling. But at mm -hmm. least I was able to look through. So there's daylight being transferred through from one side of the facade to the other one. But there is also other rooms. Next slide, like this one here, which this this reminded us of what was the hall called on Manoa? Oh, next Gartley my Hall. Building? Gartley Hall, yeah. which I just renovated in a yeah. very sort of a, a standard uh, corporate um, classroom manner. Right. As you can see them anywhere in the world or in America, these yeah. drop ceiling yeah. acoustic panels and you know, the floor tiles and this sort of furniture. So th this doesn't come across as being very tropical to me. No. I don't know about you. I can agree with that, yes. <laughs> So let's move, get outside again. This is that lanai that also happens on the on the on the on the second floor here, which is probably the, the really the nicest space. And next slide here shows how much uh, attention they basically yeah. pay. If we can move on to the next slide, yeah, please. Here you can see um, they uh, they you know they spend you know have these wood slats, which is sort of this sort of dropped I guess sky ceiling mountain undulation thing and they got these sort of vertical bar guardrails so so nice finishes nice architectural integrity uh, one has to say and to so the next slide we see um, wh wherever that um, you know you deviate away from that sort of frontal facade which is made out of CMUs which we get to in a second you can see another material being introduced and that's plaster or stucco and here it's painted white and as you already can see in that picture, but even more in the next picture, uh, that doesn't age that well, especially where you got kids and, you know, their their backpacks and smashing each other around in the hallways. You know, this is getting wear and, wear and tear uh, and you also very had, soon. And we'd also pointed out before, as you aptly said, this is situated on red dirt. And in the situation of the earlier buildings by the Haras, we saw that there was a staining of the red dirt against the, the gray mm -hmm. concrete, which actually was kind of aesthetically interesting. The red dirt on this white plaster, this white textured surface, is not going to look as good. And that is a, no. that's going to be a maintenance thing. Exactly. And that, that was actually sort of a deja vu for me to say, hey, wait a minute, this sort of reminds me of myself some many years ago. If we go to the next slide, uh, there's a project we did um, about more than a decade ago uh, for the federal German government uh, and for the army, for the military. This was a similarly sort of untouched land where we had to make something out of nothing. And you can see the study model up there that were sort of undulating the landscape. And and so we, we came up with this sort of design. And you can you, we use, uh, this is a proof of evidence that sometimes we bring in cars as sort of vehicles for thought. But we do this also in our design. So this one here was inspired in an abstract way by the, uh, by the uh, VW 181, which you call the thing. And I think we're going to do a show about V-dubs in Hawaii we pretty are. soon. This auto. We certainly are. So let, let's go to the next slide here, which shows sort of the, the result has sort of a similar sort of scaping of, of roof lines here in a sort of extra again sort of a, a way. But moving on to the next slide, more important for us is to design from inside out. So we wanted this sort of universal space, this panoramic view. And in order to achieve that, that was built, which is shown on the second from left top picture as a steel construction while the other parts of the building are built with something that we introduced in a, actually Howard Wig in a show with uh, uh, a Tropic here, Rockwood, and, and two builders, uh, this is autoclave area to concrete, as you can see in that sample piece here. And that's, that's, that's uh, concrete, that's micro uh, porosity mm -hmm. engineered with, with air cavities, so it's, it's structurally sound, but also thermally sound for you know, hotter and colder climates. So that might be something to consider for our island. So let's move on to the next slide here, which shows actually the southern elevation of that. So 
So an approach to basically carve out that mass, uh, bring daylight in, actually bring solar gain in there. There's additional shades that roll down from the top, and then we smuggled in that people can also sit outside a few times. It's kind of nice in Germany, which isn't all the time, like in Hawaii, yeah, right? Right. And I also so want to say to too. The, let me let me just before mm -hmm. we say before we leave, I just want to say too that again. Let's emphasize this is an army mess hall, as we would say in, in English. Mm -hmm. So this is mm -hmm. not an elegant building. I mean, it wasn't intended to be an elegant building, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it has a very elegant, sharp appearance. And I think they were darn lucky to get architects who do something as nice as this for a military facility. We appreciate it. No, thank you for that. And now while we're sharing that next picture shows us the building we're looking at today, uh, so next slide, please. Yeah. So mm -hmm. here you can see that sort of similarity of, you know, a sculptural form that's been right. sort of carved out. But again, I mean, remember, you almost see the same volume system. But again, we're in temperate climate. It gets damn hot and freaking cold as yeah. it is right now. So I think that justifies more that design approach versus uh, why we're in the tropics. And we're in a very arid part, so the question is, what is that sort of fixed glazing system here, Conier 1500 or whatever you call that, doing there? That makes us sort of wonder. And and also what's not class is CMU. Let's go to the next slide. Right. And um, so here, John and Mayumi told us that they work with Tileco, Tileco, you Tileco. Is that what is Oh, Tileco, of course, yeah, I should have known. So they work with them as sort of a local, sort of a post-contact indigenous manufacturer of something that's very abundant in the uh, sort of Campbell Industrial Park out there in the in the couple A Plains. And we feature a couple of shows up there with Adam Campers and Left Campers and Peter Shi, who have been innovators in the field of, of cementaceous um, tectonics. So they're they're right in this tradition and they developed and custom made this 12 by 12 by 12 um, CMU block. So let's check out what the new architect did on the right. next slide here. And uh, and you, you got to help me out because I, we read in the project description or on DZIM, this online platform, that they were uh, inspired by Kappa. And you help me out with that a little bit. Okay, well, Kappa is the indigenous Hawaiian fabric. It's made of bark that has been pounded repeatedly to make it into sheets of fabric. And the several things that I pointed out, Kappa does have an impressed design that's called a watermark based on how it's been hit by a, a device that has patterns in it. But it can, I personally do not see a lot of Kappa influence there. And something else that also struck me is that fabric is a loose flowing substance, if you will, and this is concrete. So I don't see a lot of an analogy between this wall and Kappa. Um, however, I'm not saying it's unattractive, but I don't see a lot of connection between those two substances. It's probably something that you like to call ornamental. That's exactly right. Which which we discussed, Hawaiian culture wasn't actually that much. Exactly. There are other Polynesian cultures who were way more symbolic and way more ornamental, whereas the Hawaiian ones were way more practical, right? And and the pattern came out of was sort of a side effect of practicality That's and certainly right. giving it a giving it some personality that, you know, was distinct to the author That's of right. it. So we, we're yeah. sort of, and when you talk about watermarks or water stains, I think this one here is just going to look dirty because all the dust, which is predominant there, the red dust is going to settle on these little horizontal ledges there and basically water is going to wash it down. So we're not quite sure, you know, if this is the right direction they were going. And uh, next slide is something that we have suggested together with Les and Adam Campers here um, some years ago. We were saying, why don't you do a tropical textile? That's the nickname for this project here. It's basically large, like chimney um, uh, block uh, um, um, breeze soleils that basically yeah. let the breeze through, so this is a breathable building. So we're thinking maybe this would be the direction to go, yeah. that um, you do a way more climate responsive um, uh, approach that basically then looks appealing too. Right. No, I think the, the next, I think this, this plan that you show here is always looks very appealing to me. I'd like to see this building constructed. Mm, thank you. 
And and so next slide is basically the the capacity uh, I'm I'm speaking is me as the um, if we can go to the next slide for that. It's me having done an, an even uh, closer typology. We need to go to the next slide, please. Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, no, you, no, one, one before. Oh, one before. Yeah, we've yeah, already I'm gone. We've already here. gone past it. We're so. using a we, we're using a new technology that's called vMix, I guess here. So that's our apology. We have to go to one slide before this one here, please, in order. There you go. To, Maybe I'm a little delayed here. Yeah, and this shows a, a project we've been doing for a similar client for a university. In fact, one of the, uh, Germany's oldest universities in Göttingen, and um, it became a um, a uh, an innovative building. It's it's off the grid, so in the hot summer, equally hot summer, but also equally cold winters as we have right now. It's got to work without fossil fuels, and so you know it was architecturally ambitious. This has been. Uh, recognized by all these publications here, but I want to say that, and this is hurts as an architect. You can make you know lots of architecture without uh, architects, which unfortunately actually happens a lot. But you can never do it without a client. And to do such ambitious architecture, you need an educated client. Mm -hmm. So I think what we need to do is encourage University of Hawaii as a client. To basically be more uh, pushy and basically say, hey, buildings have to be off the grid. Uh, buildings have to uh, live, work with the environment versus against it. And I sense a little bit when we talked to uh, John at Mayumi that if the client would have allowed natural ventilation, they probably would have went. They they would have gone for it. Don't you think? I think that's what I yeah potentially. How I and as I've said to you know in in libraries and certain room, uh, certain types of buildings laboratories, you have to have enclosed environments. You have to have keeping the outside mm -hmm. out. But that's not universally yeah, yeah, yeah. true for everything. And there are no. times when you can be more inclusive of outdoors. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like in an administration building where it's not a library. you got people there and yeah. not books. And people are maybe more happy and healthy to enjoy the, you know, 12 months yeah, you summer know, and spring. Paradisal circumstances yeah. versus here where we have to hide not to get a frostbite. <laughs> so uh, closing the show here with another vehicle here. This is a Chrysler or Dodge uh, Chrysler Corporation van. Mm -hmm. And this makes us think about the evolution of of innovation. I took, I found this, uh, the early one from the, uh, from the, I guess, from the 80s, mid 80s. Yeah. In Chinatown, the blue one there. This is the original uh, Chrysler um, Voyager, and and this was Lee Ayakaka's um, su success. And you told me, you know, he saves Chrysler he with that he did. with that car, pretty much, right? Yes, he did. And we happen to have my sons will not like me for that, but I threw in this picture at the very top right when there were many years ago digging in and trying to fix our third generation Chrysler Voyager and the one that you age bought is the fourth generation, and they sort of de-evolved, right? They weren't the iconic original one anymore. Right. And I think I, I read recently they're not even um, Chryslers anymore. They're now uh, Lancia Voyages because Fiat bought the Chrysler Corporation. And so what we're going to say is that little one that we dropped down there is, is a new concept study. It's called the Chrysler Portal, and it's an all-self-driving electric car with a lot of innovative features where you sort of try to reconnect to this yeah. sort of original yeah. innovativeness right. of that product. So we would encourage you, age to whatever they do as the next step, you know, pick up from where John and Mayumi were and push it yeah. to the next even more ambitious level, right? Correct, correct. But we, we don't want to close on fossil, so we want to jump to the next picture and share a little bit of what I'm current, where I'm currently. This is the picture. The big one is is me on my daily commute with my bonus son uh, to his Waldorf school, and we take this commuter train. And the guy on the right of that looks like me, but it's not me. But it's a guy who, like in frigid, frigid cold, basically wants to be hang loose and wear shorts and t-shirts. And so that's how we want to be, even in the cold, that's how we want to be. So in Hawaii, we have that all the time. So I, I threw in this little, uh, you know, um, quote from a show that Tim Apicella did with me about tropical transportation. And while the, 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 the rail thing is a done deal, or at least in the yeah. era of Kapolei, it's, it's pretty much built into reality, and we can't change it anymore. But I hope that over time we can get more climate-conducive train cars 
that are more easy yeah. breezy and not not so postmodernly a wave basically painted on as it is and you will have you know sub zero temperatures in there as you have in the buses i mean that's not tropical that's not exotic that's not what we want right correct and you've also got a you've also got a newspaper headline down in the corner too which is about uh the loss of or getting rid of cars in in cities is well, that you Thinks you're doing your German lessons so well. Uh, no, 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 no. I can see the word auto, but you told me I can't. I can't really read that. No, no, no. That's, that's certainly correct. You did your German lesson well, and that gets us to the primitiva again on the right side, which yep. we introduced as potentially housing lots of students, which we will get in combination yes. with housing lots of locals who yes. don't have the means to live somewhere else. So you can consolidate that and put them all into one very small footprint that goes tall and that you won't see as a building because it's all green and vegetated. But what one aspect we want to point out, so with that, it's basically, you know, avoid fossil transportation, yeah. use public transportation, which the, which the rail will do. But let's look into Primitiva one more time on the last slide before we phase out. And what do we see this Soto? Well, we see that, first of all, we've got uh, a lot of airflow. Second of all, we see we are, as you said, combining a lot of people into one small footprint. And finally, we hope that this is going to be a place where you don't necessarily have to leave so much because lots of things can come to you. So markets can come there. People can uh, gather there. In theory, you could just stay on site and things could come to you. And Martin just went away some more for some reason up st upstairs. Yeah, at least the sound, yeah. Yeah, the, Martin <laughs> is still with us in sound, but not in picture anymore. But I can picture the picture. You can so picture the picture. That's it. right. That's right. No, no, ab absolutely. And you're, you're right. I mean, it aims to be sort of an inclusive uh, dwelling. So you have old fogies and young yes. fogies. Yes. And they basically support each other. So it's right. a supporting system. It's not segregating right. people anymore. It's bringing people together and in a way that you have everything in the building that you need to make a comfortable living. And you don't have to go out unless you want to. And right. if you do, you use public transportation. And I places. think that's, again, we urge, obviously, the client of uh, UH uh, West Manoa to, um, West to reflect. Uh, West Oahu. I did it yep, again. I, I did, did it again. again. I'm so much a Manoa guy yeah, where I, know. I live. I, know. You don't, you know, I just don't bite the hand that feeds me. No, no, no. But we want to urge that client to pretty much rethink its program and, and be uh, a leader in research, which we're a tier one research yeah. university. So please, the next programs to really critically reflect and, and, and come up with buildings that really are cutting edge, yeah. uh, typologically, socially, ecologically, and all these things. And the thing that really strikes you when you go to the West Oahu College campus is how open it all still is and how undeveloped mm -hmm. it is. And over the decades, that is going to become urbanized. But right at the moment, we're starting from scratch, and we do have the option of building things differently than we don't have to fit them into an existing pattern or existing city. All right. There we go. I think, are we out of time? I think we're probably much? out of time. And so... Uh, so thank you, everybody. Thanks for a great show. Yes. Yeah, and I will, uh, next time... You let me go skiing, right? Yes, yeah, so Martin is going to go skiing. He's going to go up in the mountains and ski down the snow-covered slopes in Germany. And so the week after next, I'll be back next week for a Dokomomo show, but the week after that, I'll be doing a show on my own for Human Humane Architecture, and Martin can just go do whatever he wants. Well, so I will, anyway, of course, right? watch that show from my mountain chalet. You shall. You shall. You'll be drinking mm -hmm. uh, hot chocolate and things like that. So, everybody, thank you for joining us for Human Humane Architecture. I will be seeing you again in the near future, and Martin in the not-so-near future. But till then, aloha. <laughs>